Peter Frederick Strawson was born in London in 1919 and went to school at Christ College, Finchley. But it is with Oxford that his life as a leading figure in post-war British philosophy is most closely associated. In 1947, he was appointed lecturer in philosophy at University College, and he soon became a prominent member of the circle of philosophers whose work is often described simply as Oxford philosophy. Peter Strawson's association with Oxford began in 1937, when he went up to St. John's College as a scholar to read English literature. However, he persuaded the college that he should be allowed to read politics, philosophy, and economics instead. His interest in literature remains keen, and he admires style and elegance in philosophical prose. In a recent interview, he said, if I could have chosen my talents, then I would have chosen to be a poet. With the outbreak of war, he joined the army after graduation in 1940, where he served until 1946 and was promoted to the rank of captain. Recalling his army years, when among other things, he says, he learnt and forgot a lot about electronics and defended some delinquent soldiers. Most importantly, he emphasises, he married a perfect wife, Anne, in 1945. Peter's first academic post was an assistant lectureship at the University College of North Wales in 1946, where he wrote his first article, Necessary Propositions and Entailment Statements, which was accepted for publication in Mind. The same year, he won the John Locke Scholarship, which was judged by Gilbert Ryle. A year later, he was invited to become lecturer in philosophy at University College, Oxford. In 1968, he succeeded Ryle as Wayne Fleet Professor of Metaphysical Philosophy, which necessitated a move to Magdalen. He was knighted for services to philosophy in the Queen's Jubilee year in 1977. For over 40 years, Peter Strawson's work in philosophy has had a major influence, and many of the significant developments in analytic philosophy, often highly controversial, were initiated by his writings. In a well-known article entitled Truth, published in 1949, Strawson criticized the semantic theory of truth, which gave rise to a long controversy with J. L. Austin, who defended the correspondence theory. A year later, Bertrand Russell became the target of his philosophical criticism. In the famous article On Referring, published in Mind, he criticised the philosophical aspects of Russell's theory of definite descriptions. And the work continues. At Oxford as Emeritus Professor and Honorary Fellow of St John's, Magdalen and University Colleges, throughout Britain and internationally, Strawson remains a prominent figure on the philosophical scene. In 1987, he embarked on an extensive lecture tour of India with the Indian Council for Philosophical Research with seminars and lectures in Delhi, Calcutta, Hyderabad and Lucknow. A year later, as patron and staff member of the Sino-British Summer School of Philosophy, he lectured in Peking and travelled extensively in China. Following the death of A.J. Eyre in 1989, he became honorary president of the Summer School in 1990. In 1992, he became honorary vice president of philosophy in Britain and agreed to discuss his philosophical work on camera for this joint production with the Summer School. We now join Professor Strawson in Oxford in discussion with PhD student Miss Maite Escordia. In your work you identify three major areas in philosophy, philosophy the philosophy of language or logic, um, metaphysics and epistemology and the philosophy of mind. Um, do you attach any primacy to any of these areas? No, I'm inclined to see all three as mutually dependent aspects of a single unified inquiry. I can support that if you like. Yeah. For instance, take logic. The fundamental logical operation is predication of some general concept of some individual or individual's instances. So much for logic. Now, epistemology and philosophy of mind. We have to reflect that human beings, you and I and everyone, uh, receive all our knowledge fundamentally from experience, that is from exposure to sensible sensation, to the effect of things upon us. But at the same time, that's not enough, animals do this, we must also judge, form beliefs, employ therefore general concepts. So we have in logic, the fundamental operations of reference to particular items, to individuals, and 
general concepts applied to them in predication, reference and predication. In experience, we have the necessity of sensible receptivity of impressions and judgment employing general concepts about them. Now, uh, what about metaphysics or ontology? We'll come to that in a moment. The, the um, essential thing about uh, concepts is their generality. That is to say, the fact that they are applicable multiply. And we don't even understand the very notion of a concept unless we grasp the possible generality of their application. But now we must make our grasp of this relevant to experience, to sensible experience. How can we do that? What's the ground of doing that? Well, the necessary condition of our doing it is the possibility of our encountering in experience particular individual objects, distinguishing them as different, but at the same time recognizing them as instances of the same general concept. Without that, we have no grasp, no actual empirical working grasp of the generality of concepts. Now, the uniquely necessary ground of our ability to do just that is the spatio-temporal separation of particular individual objects. I say uniquely necessary because, of course, individual particular objects, spatio-temporal objects, can differ from each other in a variety of ways. One desk is unlike another in all sorts of ways, one person unlike another in all sorts of ways. Any two of them can differ in lots of ways. The one way in which they can't fail to differ, they couldn't, but they couldn't be two unless they were spatio-temporally separate. So the fundamental objects of reference are spatio-temporal particular individuals, and therefore they are fundamental objects of predication too. So here we have logic, epistemology and philosophy of mind, that's to say our yes. cognitive equipment, and ontology or metaphysics, what's basic among what exists, as particular spatio-temporal individuals. So all those three are united in this conclusion. Do you attach any primacy to the dis metaphysical distinction between uh, particulars and universals um, over the logical or linguistic distinction between reference and predication? Well, um, <coughs> in a sense, I'm inclined to say no, because if we were, say, pure intellects without sensible experience, this wouldn't apply because we could just think about, say, numbers, which are not spatial temporal individuals. So it's because of our cognitive equipment, our uh, epistemology or philosophy of mind, coupled with the special status of spatial temporal particulars, coupled with what's fundamental in logic, namely reference and predication, that we arrive at this result. It doesn't. If I have to choose to make one fundamental, I will choose the ontological distinction. But I don't. I Okay. prefer to regard them all as equally fundamental. Now concerning particulars, um, you say in individuals that material bodies or the things that have material bodies are the basic particulars in our conceptual scheme. What are the conditions that make partic particulars basic? That make, special t that make enduring material bodies basic among particulars, mm. you're asking. Yes. Good. Um, well, uh, that again is fairly straightforward. Um, it makes no sense to think we could talk about particular individuals, individual particulars, unless we could, in principle, identify them, know which ones we're talking about, be able to indicate which ones we're talking about. Now, the individuation of particulars of all kinds depends fundamentally on their spatio-temporal location in a single, unified, spatio-temporal system. But we couldn't even have a grasp of the notion of a unified, spatio-temporal system unless we encountered in experience relatively persisting individual particulars, and uh, not only just one or two of them, but in sufficient number and sufficiently stable and traceable relations to give us this very notion of a unified spatio-temporal system. And those are precisely material bodies, objects, and persons, and indeed animals in general, including ourselves. <laughs>
There is another sense of basic, however. Yeah. Um, scientists might suggest that atom electrons and so on are basic in the sense of sustaining or supporting the observable, directly observable material bodies. Um, would you accept the second sense of basic? And would you accept that electrons, atoms and so on are basic in the second sense? Um, I'm not sure about sustaining. I would accept composing or mm. making up. Um, and I'm not wanting to quarrel with that, uh, as it were, rival sense of basic. From the physicist's point of view, whose subject is the natural, the material world, it's perfectly reasonable to say, well, what is basic from our point of view is what are the ultimate constituents of matter. Hence, atoms, electrons, or nowadays we go further, no doubt, quarks, fields, and whatnot. So I would accept that as, uh, an, as another sense of basic, but not one that is of primary concern to philosophers, who are above all concerned with our conceptual scheme, with our necessary framework of thought in general about reality, about the world. And the scientists themselves have to start with this scheme, this is indispensable to them, to pursue their inquiries. Do you think if we had different perceptuals, if we had had different perceptual oh. mechanisms, uh, electrons, atoms and so on would have turned out to be the basic particulars in our conceptual scheme? If these ultimate items, whatever they are, did perceptibly have the necessary qualities of endurance through time and had them manifested them in sufficiently stable and enduring relations, that wouldn't be impossible. If we had, like Locke said, microscopical eyes and could detect the ultimate particles, which we can't, that wouldn't be impossible. But uh, I know nothing of physics, but it seems to me unlikely that they would qualify, even given the impossible hypothesis that we could perceptibly detect them. So I think, uh, uh, given the um, sensible equipment we actually have, the uh, original argument stands. Thank you. Following his discussion at Oxford with Mrs. Skordia, Professor Strawson agreed to participate in a recorded conversation with Dr. Martin Davis, reader in philosophy at Birkbeck College, University of London, and Professor Mark Sainsbury, head of the Department of Philosophy at King's College, University of London. We join the discussion now with a question from Professor Sainsbury. So your claim is that um, the enduring bodies are uh, basic in the following sense, that whereas events are dependent for their identification upon enduring bodies, enduring bodies are not so dependent for their identification on events. Um, I presume that's doctrine that it's, it's underpinned by the thought that although we can identify an event without identifying a material body, we do so only by first identifying some position in space and time, and that that identification is itself dependent upon the identification of enduring particulars. Yes, that's certainly my view. Well, I wonder then if we could move on to a different uh, dependence that you explore in the third chapter of Individuals. Um, there you claim that the concept of a person is primitive. And again, this is like the notion of basic when we're talking about basic particulars. This is a term of art. Could you say what it means for a concept to be primitive? Well, in the first place, uh, calling the concept of a person primitive was meant as a rejection of Cartesian substance dualism. That is yeah. the idea that the concept of a person could be analysed as that of a thinking substance or a mental substance in a peculiarly intimate relation with a corporeal or material substance. I wanted to reject that idea. Right. Um, you suggest, in, as part of that rejection, that um, persons are to be distinguished from other material things by the fact that there is a range of predicates, you call them um, p-predicates, predicates such as is thinking hard, which apply to persons but don't apply to other material things. 
And there's also a range of predicates. You call them the M for material predicates, such as weighs 140 pounds, which apply both to persons and also to other material things. So somebody might feel that although you had rejected a Cartesian dualism of substances, there remained in your thought a dualism of, of properties, the properties corresponding on the one hand to the M predicates, the physical or material properties, and the properties corresponding to the P predicates, the properties that are specific to persons. Would that be a correct interpretation of the position? Uh, yes, I'm perfectly happy to accept a dualism of mental and physical states, or if you prefer, psychological and material states, mm -hmm. or events, mm -hmm. or even properties. Though it's fair to add that some properties involve an inextricable mixture of both the mental and the physical. For example, uh, writing a letter, uh, taking part in a conversation, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I guess there are what remains are some questions about the causal interaction between these these properties, and that's uh, an issue that has puzzled people in a number of contemporary debates. Uh, it has indeed. Um, um, if you have to settle for one relation rather than another, I think the causal would be the best answer in a good many cases. I know there are difficulties about that, but it might be better not to insist to allow that, for example, every mental state has some kind of physical realization, as they say, or basis, mm -hmm. without being more specific about what that actually means. Uh, whether you're uh, committed to psychophysical laws or not, uh, or whether you want token token identity, as Davidson says, I don't think the token token identity works, uh, but Again, there's a certain uh, hesitation about about um, going for causal connections if, as in general the case, as in general the cases, you can't in specific particular cases say what the causal connection is. Would you like to say a little bit about why you don't think token token identity works? Um, I think that uh, the physical realization or basis for a given mental state, uh, the discussion of that and its relations, its causal relations with other physical states is one story. Mm -hmm. And the causal relation, the, the, the explanatory story you tell about mental operations uh, and their relations to physical behavior, for example, is a totally different story which has no points of connection with the purely physical story. So the idea of identifying the items in these two totally discrepant stories seems to me absurd. Well, there is the view that the relevant context of explanation is, as they say, non-extensional, so that the very same item can be involved in quite different and discrepant explanations. Uh, Yes, um, but uh, this would require, in the particular case of the mental, physical, token, token identity, it would require uh, um, that uh, it would require the single event to have both a mental property and a physical property. Right, but. Um, Whereas it's true of substances that they can have discrepant properties, as indeed in the case of persons, right. um, mental and physical. Uh, events are not substances. They can't have totally discrepant properties. Well, Peter, you've been talking about one metaphysical question concerning persons, and I want to yes. take you to another one. Surely. This is one which has occupied many people in recent oh, yeah. years. Hmm. It's the question, how can a material thing in the world have what are called intentional or semantic properties. So the idea is persons are a kind of material thing in the world. They have mental states, they have beliefs, desires, hopes, wishes, plans, intentions, and so on. These states have determinate propositional contents. A certain person believes or hopes, fears, or wishes that penguins fly, for example. But the question is asked, 
what kind of a fact is this fact about the intentional content of the state of this particular sort of material thing in the world? What is it for, as it's often put, what is it for a material object to be the bearer of states with semantic content? Now, do you yourself feel that these are pressing philosophical problems? Well, again, I want to quarrel with the way you put the question. Uh, you said, what is it for a material object to be the bearer of states with contents? But it isn't a material object that is the bearer of states with contents, it's a person. It isn't the person as purely material object, but the person as person. Again, I insist, a concept not to be resolved in that way. When I was being more careful, I tried to say, what is it for a material thing in the world to uh, have those properties? And of course, the invitation is taken to be to offer some kind of a philosophical analysis of what it is for such a thing to have such a property. And so we've had many attempts in recent years to say that to have a state with a semantic property is for that state to stand in some relation or other of covariance or some kind of teleological relation to some external state of affairs in the world. Do you think these attempts at philosophical analysis are really answering a non-question? Oh, no. I think there is certainly a question about um, how it can be that a state of a particular person, uh, say a belief or a desire, can prompt action, and yet, since uh, uh, it's a, a belief or desire about some external object, um, how can it be that a state composed both of something internal and of something external can possibly produce action on the part of the individual person because presumably the causes of the immediate causes of his action must be internal so we have this now familiar question about externalism versus internalism and i think that's uh, a muddle actually well perhaps we shouldn't pursue that <laughs> the, muddle's question though some of us it's an interesting question some of us have expended uh, more energy than you would well, perhaps care to contemplate upon it. No, I'm prepared to say that the content of a belief or desire is, of course, uh, could only be uh, specified by relation to the external object that it's about. But a content, a propositional content, is something abstract. Of course, that, that has no causal efficacy at all. But the individual person's thinking that thought, or having that desire, that's internal all right. You can't specify the content of the desire or the proposition without external reference, but you can certainly describe whatever the, con the internal condition is that consists in having or entertaining that thought without doing anything of the kind. So the idea of a conflict here is an illusion. Right. Can I take you back then to the more <laughs> fundamental <laughs> analytical question? There's something which you spoke of as being inside, that's the having of the belief, and yeah. the belief has a certain content which we specify in terms of objects and properties in the external world. Right. If we just take some internal state, call it S, and some content, call it the proposition that P, and now ask, can we give any kind of philosophically illuminating analysis of the notion S, a state, has the content that P? For example, an analysis in, ter analysis in terms of causation, or an analysis in terms of teleology, or an analysis in terms of um, the intentional stance, or an analysis in terms of radical interpretation. Does any of these seem to you to have really shed light upon what it is for a state to have a certain content? Um, well, what the internal condition of the person is, is a question to which I don't regard us as competent to produce an answer. That's more for, well, I don't know, cognitive psychologists or some breed to me uh, un unknown. Um, but uh, characterizing the, uh, s the internal state in terms of its content, say, a belief that P. Uh, this, I think, so what is it to have a belief that P? Well, ah. Uh, it certainly is the case that having a belief is intimately linked with a disposition to 
act in a certain way in certain circumstances. I wouldn't wish to reduce it to such a disposition. That would be uh, claiming too much. But that it's intimately and conceptually linked with such a disposition, I would concede. That's only a partial answer. We've been considering uh, the way in which your uh, approach to persons has uh, an impact which might be called clearly metaphysical. It tells us something about the nature of a person. And in particular, that a, a person is not some composite of Cartesian substances, one mental and the other physical. But it seems to me likely that when you wrote individuals, one of the problems that philosophers regarded as most pressing was the so-called problem of other minds, which is an epistemological problem, the problem of how one can know that there are any persons other than oneself. And your argument in individuals has sometimes been called a transcendental argument. I thought I might just um, read a sentence from it. <coughs> you refer there to a certain conclusion which you characterize in the following way. One ascribes P predicates, those are the psychological predicates, to others on the strength of observation of their behavior. And the behavior criteria one goes on are not just signs of the presence of what is meant by the P predicate, but are criteria of a logically adequate kind for the ascription of the P predicate. And you go on. The point is not that we must accept this conclusion in order to avoid skepticism, but that we must accept it in order to explain the existence of the conceptual scheme in terms of which the skeptical problem is stated. So it looks as if there's a strong conclusion there that um, in, in order even to understand skepticism, one has to accept that there are other persons and thus the skeptical problem is done away with. Would that be a correct account of your position? Uh, I think it's certainly true that in order to be able to have a conception of oneself and of one's own states of mind, one must have and be able to apply a conception of other people and their states of mind. So you must be able, or you must regard yourself as able to identify the mental states of others in order even to have the notion of a having a mental state yourself. Since after all, mental predicates are such that they must apply to a variety of items, and you couldn't have these predicates as such, or apply them to yourself as predicates, unless you thought of them as applicable to others also. Barry Stroud famously criticized your, your argument here. He characterized it as a, as a transcendental argument and said that transcendental arguments of the kind that you use depend upon the verification principle, the principle that uh, the meaning of a sentence is given by the conditions under which it can be known to be true. Uh, he says, for example, if this principle, the verification principle, is not true, Strawson's argument is unsound. And he says, again, the success of Strawson's attack on both forms of skepticism depends on the truth of some version of what I have called the verification principle. Is that a just criticism by Stroud? It's worth pointing out that Stroud not only offered the alternative of unsoundness of the arguments on the ground that they depended on the verification principle, but also uh, added that the most they could establish was a kind of uh, conceptual interdependence, mm -hmm. uh, that in order to have a certain concept we must have or believe we can apply that same concept in the case of personal uh, psychological states to other people. So, but even if this is granted, of course, it doesn't follow that those beliefs of ours are true. Right. So the solipsist alternative remains open, even if it's granted that in order to be able to apply psychological predicates to oneself, one must believe that one apply, uh, can apply them correctly to others. Well, um, in a way, I'm disposed to settle for that uh, uh, because um, I would add that even if you're prepared to go on entertaining the solipsist hypothesis as a pure hypothesis, this isn't really an option open to you as a serious um, doubt or 
doubt at all. But so, we cannot right. but see other people as other people with comparable mental conditions to our own. We have no option in this matter. So it would be a pretense uh, to say that you are seriously worried about the existence of other people. And, and when you say we have no option, yeah. is that a remark about our about a contingent aspect of our psychology? Or is there a more logical point underlying it that um, on pain of contradiction we, we can't contemplate this, this no, alternative? No, certainly not on pain of contradiction. Right. Uh, I, I would say in a way it doesn't make sense for us, um, but this is not because it's strictly self-contradictory. It's only that um, the belief in the existence of other people and their having mental conditions like our own is something we're absolutely landed with and can't get away from. Um, it part of what you might call the uh, general framework within which all doubts and queries and reasonings make sense. Um, so it's something inescapable in that sense. I wonder if we could get even clearer on the present mm. position on these uh, topics mm. by comparing the case of other minds that you've just been discussing with the case of free will, which you talk about in that uh, paper, Freedom and Resentment, also the title of a collection, Freedom and Resentment and Other Essays. Mm -hmm. There you say that the idea that we do not, after all, act freely is something, a hypothesis which, well, we can't live with or we can't seriously inhabit that hypothesis. We can't take it as a fully serious option. But that seems to be a statement not as strong as it's a precondition of the whole conceptual scheme within which certain considerations so much as make sense. So I wonder if we might ask you, would you accept that the claims about other minds and about material bodies even, as you would now wish to make them, have no more strength than the claim that you would want to make about free will? I wouldn't put it quite as weakly as that. I'd say they have just as much strength. Uh, that's to say, just as we're naturally committed and inescapably committed to belief in the material world and in other people, so we are naturally committed to certain kinds of reaction to other people behavior and our own, uh, which imply uh, our readiness to take uh, uh, disapprobative or approbative attitudes both to other people and our own and these wouldn't make sense unless we credited them with knowing what they were doing and responsibility for their actions and insofar as freedom is linked to responsibility then indeed we are naturally committed to the belief in freedom of action. Whether this doesn't involve some uh, metaphysical and indeed uh, an intelligible con libertarian conception of freedom, but it does involve all that we actually need or can hope for in the way of, of responsibility and freedom. So it does seem that amongst hypotheses that we are naturally landed with, yeah. things that are inescapable for us, there could, as a matter of principle, be some which do not in fact play an essential or pivotal role within a conceptual scheme. That's to say, some things that we are naturally landed with might be such that, had we not been, we could still have deployed the same conceptual scheme that we in fact deploy. Now, if that's correct, then it seems that amongst the class of propositions that we are naturally landed with, we'd want to make a further distinction between those which play a pivotal role in the conceptual scheme and those which don't. But then it would seem that that's really where all the argument would have to take place. And as I understood your answer about free will, the idea is that the fact that we do have free will, we take each other to have free will and to perform freely, is in the class of propositions that we are naturally landed with, which also play a pivotal role in the conceptual scheme. I'm not sure that they play quite such a pivotal role as the ones that you otherwise mentioned, namely uh, the belief in other people with mental states and the belief in external objects. Indeed, the former entails the latter. Um, uh, because I suppose it's conceivable that one might um, 
um, view other people, indeed equipped with mental attributes and so on, as um, people about whom one was disposed not to make, uh, not to indulge in the kind of reactions that we do indulge in, that resentment, approbation, and the rest of it, and perhaps even confine these to ourselves, so that we could be uh, ashamed of some of our own behavior and congratulate ourselves on others, and take no moral view of others whatever. Just view them entirely objectively. Oh, well, that's the sort of person he is, that's the way he might naturally behave, ridiculous being uh, indignant about it, that's, that's just the way things are with him. So that's conceivable, that we could be a kind of moral solipsist, that's to say, go in for self-blame and perhaps even self-approval sometimes, more rarely, but refrain from any moral reaction to other people. I think it's very, very unlikely, and indeed it would impoverish our emotional lives considerably. But that would, I don't want to rule that out absolutely in the way I want to rule out absolutely um, skepti serious skepticism about other minds or material objects. So one task for an analytic philosopher would be to take the class of propositions that we are <coughs> landed with, which we find inevitable mm. to accept, and then to rank them by their embeddedness, no. if you will, mm. in the conceptual scheme. Right. And You've indicated yeah. that proposition yeah. that we act freely would be less deeply embedded. Yes, yes. This is possibly because I'm less interested in moral and political philosophy than in metaphysics, epistemology, and philosophy of language. <laughs> Peter, I wonder if I can take you to a rather different topic. Mm -hmm. One of the major debates in recent analytic philosophy has been about realism and anti-realism. Well, the terms of the debate are not altogether easy to define, but the realist says something along the lines that what's true outruns what's verified or what can be warrantably asserted. So statements about bodies existing unperceived or statements about happenings in distant places or the remote past, all these may be true, even though there's no way that we shall ever find out that they are true. Where do you stand on this issue? I think that <coughs> questions of the truth or falsity of st statements far outrun our capacities for establishing or discovering their truth or falsity or even having decent grounds for asserting or denying them. Well, a generally realist attitude which you take doesn't merely allow that what's true can outrun what we have evidence for. It's also the case on a generally realist view of things that all the evidence may pile up in favor of a proposition, although it's not true. So the evidence can point us in the wrong direction. So we can be the victims of various kinds of illusions, perceptual illusions, and cognitive illusions as well. In fact, there's a general trade-off here. The more realistic, or the more realist your metaphysics, the more your epistemology faces skeptical problems. Well, given all that by way of a kind of background, isn't there perhaps a tension between your realism and what you say in the introduction to logical theory about the problem of induction? What I have in mind is that in your discussion of the justification of induction in introduction to logical theory, you say that it would be wrong to measure the practice of relying upon induction against some standard external to that practice. In fact, you say, Reliance upon induction is reasonable because doing this is what being reasonable means in such a context. But wouldn't we expect a realist to ask for rather more than that? I don't see why we should. Uh, the fact is, well, there are two relevant facts. One is that reliance upon induction in general is as much part of our inescapable natural commitment as belief in external things or in the reality of other people. That's one point. So it's inescapable anyway. The other point is that uh, most of our concepts of objective things require, contain as part of their, uh, uh, as part of the concept, the notion that those things have certain powers or characteristically behave in certain ways. So the very acceptability of those concepts depends upon 
our belief in regularities in the behavior of things in nature. That actually sounds like slightly more by way of a justification of induction than merely the, uh, the sentence that I quoted, doing this is what being reasonable means in such a context. Yes, it is more, and the more the, more the better. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the topic of realism, I thought it might be helpful to compare your own views with the views of, of Kant. Your, your book, The Bounds of Sense, is devoted to, to Kant's philosophy. And you uh, note Kant's distinction between empirical realism, um, that doctrine Kant claims to hold, and transcendental idealism, another doctrine which Kant says he holds. I wonder if you could say something, first of all, to distinguish these two doctrines, um, and then perhaps whether you could say if you yourself now espouse either of them. Well, I, in the book in question, I defended what Kant calls empirical realism, and I would just call it realism, um, and uh, said that uh, it makes perfect sense without appealing in any way to the dubious doctrines of transcendental idealism. I take the doctrine of transcendental idealism to be the doctrine that of the nature of things as they are in themselves, as opposed to appearances or what we can call empirical realities, we can know nothing whatever, in principle or ever. And I think my comment on that would be, if this were the case, then we could have no conceivable interest in the nature of things in they are in themselves, so we could dismiss the whole idea. Of the three areas of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, logic and language, the one we've really hardly touched on so far is logic and language. Well, a fundamental notion in that area is that of truth. And in the 1950s, you were involved in a famous debate with Austin on that subject. And it was about that time you wrote that the central idea in a philosophical account of truth is that to predicate truth of a statement is, to, is equivalent to affirming that statement. Have you changed your view since then? Uh, <clears throat> not in any essential way, but it needs a bit of qualification in that we may want to say something like, I'm sure that what X said is true without being able to reaffirm the statement without knowing indeed what it mm. was. However, the substance of the position can be retained by glossing that as, I don't know exactly what S said, X said, but I'm sure that things are indeed as he said they were in making it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's general, perfectly general. Right. To say that a statement is true is to say that things are as anyone who made that statement thereby said they were. Now, another central idea in the, in, <coughs> yes. in, the, in the area of logic and language is, mm. of course, that of reference, yes. often closely linked with truth. And Bertrand Russell at one time suggested that for something to be a symbol is for it to symbolize something. And that seems to be like saying for an expression to have meaning at all is for it to refer to something. Do you think there's any validity in that thought that struck Russell is so obvious? No, I think that's false, quite simply. There are many expressions which make perfectly good sense and don't refer to anything at all. For example, phlogiston. Another example, a complex symbol. Uh, a man who is more than 10 feet tall. I may be wrong about that, but it seems to be extremely unlikely that it refers to anything at all. And then a more interesting case is the case of what are called logical connectives. Not, or, and, if. I don't think they have any reference, though they certainly are perfectly good symbols, which have a very important meaning. Can we focus just on the case of subject and predicate terms then? Can I ask you a question about the reference of predicate expressions? Surely. Leaving aside logical constants and so on, perhaps yep. for later, yes. I'd like to set this example up using a non-basic case of individual and general or universal. Mm. So a non-basic case of subject and predicate. It's a sentence you yourself gave as an example. Happiness is found in all stations in life. Now, happiness is an individual, an abstract individual, and the word happiness is a subject expression which introduces that individual. 
But in another sentence, say, William is happy, the very same item, happiness, is introduced by a predicate expression. Now this distinguishes your view about the items that correspond to predicates from Frege's view, because Frege had it that the semantic value of a predicate is an item of a kind that could not be the reference of a logical subject expression or a name. On the face of it, your ontology is more economical than Frege's on this point. But is there really a substantive issue between the two views? I think there is, um, in that um, my view involves construing the predicate expression, is happy, in a different way altogether from Frege's. He takes it as a unit, is happy, uh, referring to a special kind of item, uh, concept, which he describes as ungesetigt, unsaturated. Um, in my view, the predicate expression should be recognized as having, as it were, two components. The one component, happy, which introduces the same abstract item as the abstract noun, happiness, and a copulative device, in this case the verb to be, though in other sentences it's different, which, as it were, links or ties the abstract item to the particular individual, William, of whom it's predicated. Uh, so the views are different. Mine is, as you say, more economical, though it involves paying more honor to the copula than is customary among the fully paid up followers of Frege. Well, can I now go back to introduction to logical theory, Certainly. and in fact to logical constants? Oh, yes. In a very famous section of that book, oh. you talk about the truth functional constants of formal logic, oh. and you compare them with the ordinary language words and, or, not, if. No. Now, for example, you note that in a use of the natural language conjunction, as in P and Q, such a use can carry the implication of temporal order. It doesn't always, but it can. And of course, that's a different implication from the implication carried by Q and P, and you gave some celebrated examples of that phenomenon. In contrast, you say that the logical symbol, often symbolized with a dot or an ampersand, is completely symmetrical. Mm. Now, on the face of it, you're arguing, well, we're arguing back in 1952, for a difference in meaning between natural language and, and the logical ampersand. Now, subsequently to that, Paul Grice developed his theory of conversational implicatures, and with it, a distinction between semantics and pragmatics, between meaning and use, between truth and appropriateness. So Grice would say, that although natural language and has the same meaning or the same semantics as logical ampersand or dot, its use creates, via certain principles and maxims which Grice elaborated, the implicature or implication or suggestion of temporal order. How do you now see the relationship between logical language and natural language? Well, to take specific cases, I think in the case of and, Grice was absolutely right, and if I made the contrary suggestion 40 years ago, I was wrong. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that I'm going to agree with him on all points about even logical constants. For example, in the case of if, I think by parity of reasoning, he would uh, tend to argue that if has the same meaning in natural language as the philonian or material implication has in formal logic. And this I would still dispute. It's a long story, that. So, so there are cases and cases. Yes. And perhaps we might move to another case, the case that was discussed in your celebrated 1950 paper on referring. Mm -hmm. So in that paper, you were criticizing an account that Russell had given of definite descriptions. So Russell had, roughly speaking, analyzed definite descriptions as a mm. kind of complex quantifier expression you maintained, on the contrary, that definite descriptions often function as names, that's to say, as logical subject expressions. Mm. Well, returning to uh, this topic in subject and predicate in logic and grammar, you said it may be that sometimes descriptions function as names, and sometimes more after the pattern of a Russellian analysis, 
from the fact that the expressions share a recognizable English structure, it doesn't follow that all of them, in all their occurrences, are best fitted in the same way into the frame of logic. So that's what you say in subject and predicate in logic and grammar. Now I wonder how you'd respond to the suggestion that we should once again here adopt a kind of Gricean strategy and distinguish between semantics and pragmatics. So the idea would be, roughly speaking again, that Russell was pretty much right about the semantics, the meaning of definite descriptions, semantically <coughs> they're complex quantifier expressions. That's to say, the man belongs semantically with a man, every man, most men, three men, and so on. But definite descriptions can be used, as can any quantifier expression, to communicate a message about a particular individual. There's a distinction there between meaning and use, and the suggestion would be that this fact about use is to be explained by pragmatic theory, not by semantic theory, just as the fact about the use of and to suggest a temporal order is to be explained by Grice's theory of conversation <coughs> and picatures. What do you make of this suggestion? Well, this is uh, another case where I <coughs> stick with my original suggestion, as I did about if, and <coughs> would say that definite descriptions in general are simply definite singular terms. Um, the point is, really, that most of them are capable of multiple applications the table, the man, the baby, and so on. And uh, the application they have in a particular case will depend on contextual features. And this is part of the semantics of the expressions, just as in the case of demonstratives, that is the case. Of course, there may be rather special cases in which a Rossidian analysis is suitable and indeed even literally true. I have an example. The only man who refused to sign was shot. Now that really does mean there was somebody who uniquely refused to sign and was shot. So the Rossidian analysis fits perfectly there, as the word only suggests. But for the most part, I think descriptions, as I've said, function as definite singular terms comparable in the respects I mentioned with demonstrative and other indexical expressions. Well, we've been speaking about Paul Grice's theory of conversational implicatures, instances where you'd accept the use of that theory, instances where you would differ from Grice. Of course, Grice also had a theory about the analysis of the notion of literal meaning. Grice was your tutor for one term when you were an undergraduate, and of course you wrote a very famous paper in defense of a dogma with him back in 1956. Grice died in 1988, and his papers have been collected in Studies in the Way of Words. What do you think will be the lasting influence of his work? Well, I think in particular the, the theory of conversational implicature, as distinguished from the literal semantic meaning of the words, is a contribution of lasting and fundamental importance in the philosophy of language. As for his general analysis of the nature of linguistic meaning, developed in an earlier paper and refined since, um, that, of course, is of the greatest possible interest and ingenuity and power. Um, whether it will be finally accepted seems to be much more dubious. I would myself be inclined to believe that the semantic and the psychological couldn't, uh, it wasn't a question of reducing the former to the latter as he ultimately tried to do. I don't think that reduction is, in the end, likely to work. I would prefer to speak of a reciprocal dependence of the two. Is there anything you can say in uh, one sentence about why that reduction doesn't seem to you to be likely to work? Um, or several sentences. <laughs> it's just too implausible. <laughs> <laughs> Is it based on inductive grounds that people have tried to make it work and been rather conspicuously well, failing? A notable example was Schiffer, who originally tried to make it work Indeed. and then ditched it. Uh, he overdid the ditching, I think, because he ditched not only that, but a whole lot of much more respectable doctrines, in my view, as well. <laughs> but he did it very well. <laughs> well Grice was one of, one of your contemporaries, one of the famous um, Oxford no. philosophers, as, they, as, as you and others became known. Among them, too, was um, uh, 
rather older than you, I think, am I right? With yes. John Austin. Yes. Um, how do you think um, his work has been received? Do you think it's been? Do you think people have done sufficient justice to it? Have they? Have they noted its lessons adequately? Um, that's a difficult question. Uh, at the time, his influence was enormous on the practice of Oxford philosophers, mm -hmm. or some of them at any rate. Not, I think, so much on my own, uh, in that I never believed, or didn't at the time of writing individuals believe, that the ordinary language method was enough mm -hmm. to cope with the most general questions in philosophy. On the other hand, his contribution to philosophy of language and speech act theory is again, like crisis, of lasting importance in the philosophy of language. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a, a lasting um, influence. Gilbert, Gilbert Ryle was a great benefactor of the subject, it seems to me. Uh, he promoted the existence of a, of a graduate school in Oxford, which has been a great success. Uh, his own work is marked by uh, brilliance, I would think, was the principal characteristic. He, he wasn't as certainly as careful or as accurate as Austin, but um, he, he shone like a star on the scene. And uh, his book, The Concept of Mind, his, his magnum opus, as it were, um, though, uh, as he himself rightly said, it's a generation book, is nevertheless still worth reading, not only as a contribution to philosophy, but as a contribution to English literature. It's brilliantly done. And what about students? You must have taught a large number of distinguished and interesting people in your time in Oxford. Which of them stand out particularly? Well, during my career as a tutorial fellow at University College, uh, teaching undergraduates, far and away the best student I ever had was Gareth Evans, who was brilliant, who in a tutorial when you thought, uh, you know, maybe we'll reach this point in 20 minutes, Gareth would suddenly leap there. He was extraordinarily quick and gifted, and his death so early was a great loss to us all. Now, as a professor, of course, I taught graduate students rather than undergraduates, and of, I, I had a good many distinguished and able characters then. Um, the one I thought best of is now a fellow of Wadham College, Oxford, by name Kasim Kassam. Uh, but Schiffer was one of them whom I taught as an, when I was a tutorial fellow, actually, and he was extremely bright as well extremely fertile of difficult counterexamples to any thesis one liked to mention. We spoke at the very beginning about analytic philosophy. <coughs> and the most familiar contrast is with continental philosophy. So I wondered how you view the relationship between what you've been doing and the philosophy that's pursued not so very far away across the channel and that uh, gets mm -hmm. called continental philosophy. Yes. I think the expressions are a little misleading in that in many European continental countries uh, philosophy that I would recognize as analytical philosophy and we all would is pursued effectively and quite powerfully especially in Germany not to mention Holland Belgium the Scandinavian countries uh, even Spain now and to some extent in Italy the most resistant country to this uh, uh, admirable strain, I'm afraid is my favorite European country, namely France. <laughs> However, even there, some of the younger philosophers uh, practice what I would recognize as analytical philosophy, especially in the field of philosophy of language. Indeed, one young philosopher I spoke to in Paris said that when people ask him what he did, he preferred to say, um, I'm a linguist, so as not to confuse them by saying he was a philosopher and leading to mistaken expectations. Um, Sometimes we draw the contrast by uh, speaking of Anglo-American analytic philosophy. Maybe that's not a very happy term either. No. But uh, surely there are some differences between the way oh, yes. analytic philosophy is carried on in Britain and in the USA. I don't know exactly what, but perhaps philosophers in America are um, more liable to take uh, on board the idea coming from Quine that philosophy is continuous with science. Does your own experience suggest, as you've lectured in America and taught for many years in Britain, that analytic philosophy in the USA 
is more liable to be tempted by reductionism or scientism? Yes, I think that would be a correct judgment, although the temptation is not, is not unfelt on this side of the Atlantic as well, Indeed. I'm sorry to say. Um, however, uh, the temptation is resisted on both sides, effectively, I think. Uh, so there's no danger of the subject as we understand it, I speak for us all, I hope, um, being uh, absorbed by the scientism uh, that does have too much weight, I think, in the United States. Perhaps with these contrasts with so-called continental philosophy and these differences between mm. the British and American ways of doing analytic philosophy, we can see analytic philosophy as treading a kind of path between, on the one side, literature and literary criticism, on the other side, the natural and social sciences. Now, given the undoubted appeals felt by certainly many undergraduate students of continental philosophy, on the one hand, and the appeals of so-called cognitive science, on the other, with what confidence do you view the, the future of the approach that you've made your own in analytic philosophy, the approach that we might label, following your own label, non-reductive naturalism? I view it with confidence. Uh, the appeals of continental philosophy are unmistakable, and indeed one isn't insensitive to them. They often show a great uh, psychological, social, even historical, if you think of Hegel, insight, and um, uh, some of them write appealingly. For example, Nietzsche and even Sartre. Uh, I won't add Heidegger, because his writing is not appealing, although in some sense he shows good sense, but still. Um, uh, so I don't think that the, our way is at all seriously threatened by continental philosophy. Um, the more serious matter is the appeal of the empirical sciences, um, certainly. Uh, and cognitive science you rightly pick out in philosophy of mind as a powerful influence. But it still seems to me that the sort of conceptual analysis that we go in for, and which is really quite discrepant from the empirical sciences, is something of such uh, absorbing interest that it can't fail to have as good a future as it has had a past since Aristotle. Well, our time is now drawing to a close, and I'd like to thank you very much indeed for your very illuminating answers to our questions. Perhaps before we finish, you might like to say something about your current work at the moment. I gather there's a new book on the way. There is a new book on the way. Uh, at least it's new in the sense that it's never been published, at least in English, before. In some other language? Well, I did give uh, a few years ago a series of lectures in the Collège de France, in France, in French, and they were published. And much of the material there will appear in this book. Indeed, the contents of this book largely uh, record lectures which I gave regularly in Oxford under the title of the book itself, namely Analysis and Metaphysics. And so it could be called, and it indeed is called by me, an introduction to philosophy. Although I add that although it's introductory, it is not elementary, because I say there is no such thing as elementary philosophy.